Welcome to Grace Lutheran Church and School. We're very happy to have all of you here with us this evening on a, a pretty chilly evening as well, too. Welcome to those of you who are visiting with us via the live stream. Uh, this is always the service, or almost always the service, when we do that. But we're happy to have you with us, too. This is the start of National Lutheran Schools Week, so tomorrow is a unity service. And really, all of our day school scholars and families will be at that. Uh, so that's the reason why some of those that would come tonight aren't here. I did want to let all of you know, because some of us do have grandchildren and we're interested in this, uh, that we do have a book fair tomorrow that will open up immediately after the Unity service. So that service should end about 1130. Uh, if you had some grandchildren that you wanted to buy uh, books for. You can come to that. You'd be welcome to come to that. We're also serving coffee and donuts after the service, so you can even sneak in a little early and grab those. Everything that you're going to need for tonight will be up on the screen. I'll invite all of us to stand as we call upon our God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him? Like a leaning wall. A tottering fence. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from Him. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Those of low estate are but a breath, those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sin, O Lord, who could stand? Since we're gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, and I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God. Glory be to the Father, 
and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, mercifully look upon our infirmities and stretch forth the hand of your majesty to heal and defend us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for the third Sunday after Epiphany is from the book of Jonah, the third chapter. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according uh, to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is from 1 Corinthians, the seventh chapter. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the, the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from my anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and secure the devotion of the Lord. This is the word of God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat, the hired servants, and followed him. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated.
And of course, this is the start of National Lutheran Schools Week, so you will hear an echo of that certainly uh, in the message for tonight. And it's actually connected, which is our chapel theme for the year, but connected by vocation. Uh, so the thoughts and message about Christian vocation, that's relevant for all of us in the name of Jesus. It's always been like this throughout my time as a pastor. It's been this way, and unless you're somebody who remembers the way that it was in the Christian church back in the mid-1960s or before, it's been like this for you, too. I'm talking about using a three-year series of readings, the one that we use, and how there's a middle-of-the-season shift in Epiphany Tide from the Gospel's focus on Jesus' divine nature to Gospel readings that recall how he sends others out to proclaim that truth. The word epiphany means the appearance of the divine in the ordinary. A baby born in Bethlehem who grows up to work miracles and teach with power. Some fishermen, drops of water, pieces of bread, a kid from Connecticut sent to proclaim God's word for people at Grace Lutheran, St. Petersburg, Florida. The Epiphany season reveals the appearance of the divine in the ordinary for you. Now, honestly, when I think back to my childhood in the nutmeg state, I can remember the time before it was this way. I, I do go back that far. That's when churches followed a one-year series. You had the same readings year after year after year. And what that meant was that this weekend was the end of Epiphany. It was always celebrated as the transfiguration of our Lord. However, as an elementary school aged child, I know you won't be shocked to learn that I was not as in tune to what the gospel reading was for a particular week as I might be today. No, when I was a child, I thought like a child and all of those other things that Paul mentions. Although, when I was a child, I often did feel an inner call towards the pastoral ministry. That's true. You see, when I was a child, I loved church, singing the hymns, following the order of service that could be in English, but it could be in Latin, and I could follow it too. The smell of the candles lit and extinguished. Sadly, though, my church body back then did not allow its pastors to get married. They still don't. And as strong as that pull was towards the pastoral ministry, I also felt an inner call to be a husband, a father someday, a baseball player. I struck out on that. Later on, as I got through high school, to be a professional trumpet player. I almost made it there, but not quite. Still, I had fun times, vocations, the jobs that we do throughout our lives can be tricky things to settle into, can't they? But there are also those non-work-related vocations that we have. We're born into some of those, and there are others that we choose. And thinking about some of them, it seems appropriate to address our epistle reading just briefly, because it could be a little bit disturbing. So I will. Here's what you need to know. It's an important, it's very important to be aware that the apostles' words for this evening are taken out of a much 
greater context. The key verse for understanding what you heard, which made it sound as if it wasn't a good thing to be married, came earlier in the letter. Listen, listen to it closely. St. Paul writes, only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. Mark it well that it is not forbidden to be Christ for Christians to be married. It's not forbidden for church workers to be married either. There are some benefits to that. And Paul does mention those. You should read the middle part of this epistle. What's important is that in all things, husbands or wives, dads or moms, sons or daughters, grandfathers or grandmothers, or anyone else must put God Almighty first in a vocation. Everything begins and ends with him. That was Paul's point. Indeed, the Lord God is the one who has given you each and every one of your vocations. You may have ticked off a large number of those ones that I just mentioned, right? He's the giver of those, whatever that vocation might be. Consider the gospel for today. Here's how it started. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Imagine what it must have been like hearing that back then. It was a question from one of our eighth grade scholars last week that made me reflect on this. You see, our Lutheran schools are remarkable. I've been blessed uh, to serve in congregations with three of them now. Frankly, anyone involved in education is remarkable in my opinion. Those who teach in public settings lead by example and their faith becomes compelling. My mom did that for decades. So I know what those folks do, how hard they work, how much they love and care for their students. But imagine a setting where there is time set aside each day to talk about the faith and also the opportunity to teach about how it informs other subjects too. At our day school, we strive to put God first in all things. And our scholars learn to see how growing in knowledge of math, science, language arts, music, all right, since we have our teacher here, art, or any other subject, is a godly vocation. It's a godly vocation to be a student, a scholar, a true calling, and thus a gift from God. Our teachers are faithful in stressing that point, as well in showing how each subject ties together. You can't very well do music, can you, Corey, if you don't know math and physics? You can't grow and learn to the best of your ability if you aren't physically fit and so on and so forth. Grace is an incredible place to grow in the wisdom and knowledge about the wonders of God's universe. And, and yes, I know too that we have parents in our congregation who choose different educational options for their families and we support them because the vocation of parent is an especially godly one. Whether that means homeschooling or some other choice, we all of us here support them and help out because that's a part of our vocation, our calling, 
as your servants in Christ. Families are how God Almighty designed his world. Through them he works, one by one, bit by bit, to rebuild his kingdom. What is more, our New Testament kingdom building began to take shape in the gospel reading for today. Listen further as a reminder. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Getting back to our dear 8th grade scholar, her question was, how did the first disciples know that Jesus was the Messiah? Great question. By the Holy Spirit working through God's word being the answer. And it's most certainly true. Remember how in today's reading, just prior to the calling of the first four disciples, we learned that Jesus himself was proclaiming the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now that word gospel, oangelico in Greek, may also be translated good news. So here's the hard part for a preacher. At least for a preacher who loves the people whom God has called him to serve, as I love you. And by the way, when I say you, I mean all of you, not just those who are members of Grace Congregation, but our visitors as well, Wildcat scholars, families, alums, staff, formally called, or, or serving out of an inner call in the heart. I view all of our staff as partners in the gospel. Re regardless of how or why, if you're here in this place, you're part of our community, our family, and God has called me through the congregation to be your pastor. I take that vocation seriously because it's a joy to serve you, whether it's just for an hour in a divine service, a few weeks for winter visitors, 12 years that a scholar might be a part of our day school, or a lifetime. So again, the hard part of preaching the good news is this. It requires the preaching of the law first. There's no good news unless you recognize and realize there's a problem to solve here. So that means that it requires me to tell people whom I love that they are sinners. You are. But know it too, that I don't exclude myself here. If you're sinners, I know I'm the sinner's chief. I know because God's word says it. The Ten Commandments, these I have not kept. And again, all sin and fall short of his glory. Now, on that note, I know that lots of us are concerned about the times in which we live. We, we think they're terrible. And then the ability of our younger generation to cope with them. If the times are tough, though, it's because we prove that we are sinners each and every day. And yeah, you heard me rightly. It's not just them out there. It's us in here too. As I've said on multiple occasions, 
church is a hospital for sinners. This is where we sinners need to be. Further still, the times really aren't that much worse than they've ever been before, if they are at all. And truth be told, the coming generation is no less ill-prepared for its time than my generation was for it, or than the disciples Simon, Andrew, James, and John were at their time of their call to follow Jesus. What mattered for them is the same thing that matters for you and your children. God Almighty himself has made you and placed you in a time such as this. He's faithful, and he will do it. Use you as his hands, legs, and lips to declare his praises, to assist in the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ by which the people of this world are being saved. Finally, that saving gospel is this, that when the fullness of time had come, God sent the Son into the world to redeem it. I taught my third graders this week that to redeem means to buy back. In Jesus' case, he's redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns through all eternity. Jesus has redeemed you, and he has redeemed me, bought us back by going to the cross and dying for our sin. That's the good news that we preach here at Grace. You are redeemed by Christ the crucified and risen. The sins that you've come in here with are forgiven. Therefore, because of God's goodness and mercy, Christ's redemption is our story. And by the gift of the Holy Spirit given in baptism, it's a story that we cling to. We hold it near and dear to our hearts, in our minds, our bodies and souls. Further still, God's gifts, his goodness and mercy, are boundless. So indeed, they are being offered to all present here tonight. As we gather to celebrate this upcoming week, know that your Lutheran school, Faith Lutheran, is preparing the next generation for the variety of vocations that God gives to the glory of his name. A number of our teachers went to school at Grace. May we be faithful together in that blessed calling for Christ Jesus' sake. Praise be his holy name forever. Amen. Join with me now in praising God's name by confessing it in the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ. God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us man and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and also for us under Pontius Pilate. 
He suffered on the third. On the third day, he rose again, according to the scripture, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who is the Father and the Son together in the person of your God, who is so high the God. And I believe in one holy church in the Holy Spirit. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sin, and I look to the resurrection of the dead. You may be seated for the prayer of the church. In our prayers this evening, we remember all of those who are listed on our prayer page. Uh, we also add uh, Laura's mom, Sandy Wells, uh, to our prayers for this evening. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you desire not the death of a sinner, but that all would repent and believe the gospel. In the epiphany of your Son, your time of salvation and your kingdom have come near. As this world passes away, give faithfulness and urgency to your church to proclaim the gospel of our God to all people. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of the harvest, as you called Simon, Peter, and Andrew, James and John to follow you and made them fishers of men. So send faithful preachers of your gospel in our times. Increase the spirit of generosity to all who support the missionaries, seminaries, colleges, and other institutions of our church for the spread of the gospel and service of God's people. Be with all of our Lutheran schools and those who serve in them particularly those who serve, learn, and grow at grace. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Eternal Lord, in view of every current distress as the present form of this world passes away, give constancy and contentment to your people in their God-given vocation. Give comfort and faithfulness to the Mary and strengthen them to pass on the faith to the next generation. Your kindness also to the unmarried and assure them of the holiness of their place in life, that they would be freed from anxiety and attend to holiness in body and spirit, undividedly devoted to you. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, preserve our nation with its rulers. Call to repentance those who have forgotten you. Spare Joseph, our president, on our governor and all who serve, for the good of the people. Do not let disaster befall us, but preserve us in peace and quietness. Be with the men and women who serve in our military, all first responders, police officers, emergency personnel, those who serve in the military of our allies, and particularly watching over the region of the Middle East to bring peace there. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Merciful Father, turn us from every distracting anxiety and the dealings of this world that would draw our hearts away from your blessed gospel and its end, eternal life. Give us confidence in the resurrection and the peace of a clean conscience by the forgiveness of sin in Jesus' name. Graciously behold and help those for whom we pray, all who are listed for us on our prayer page, but particularly Sandy, the class cow, and Graham, families, and those whom we now name silently in our hearts before you. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, in your holy sacrament, you deliver the gospel proclaimed by your Son and won by his death in his true body and blood. Work repentance and faith in all who commune. 
and unite them in a sincere confession of your divine truth at this altar. Lord, in your mercy, all these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And at this time, we have a slide about our offering. I did want to say good night to all of those uh, who were online viewing us and God's blessings to you this evening. Of course, our offering plates are up front, and you're welcome to bring those with you and place them there. Uh, you can also give.